If I asked you to name a saint, what name would come to mind for you? St. Peter, or St. Matthew, or St. Mark, St. Luke? There are some of those folks who've been saints so long, it seems that saint is their first name, and their, sur- their, their name has become a surname. I, I learned at some point along the way that St. John's School is not named for the church next door, St. John the Divine, but for the school's founder, whose parents named St. John. That, that's hubris. Um, usually you wait till after adolescence for that. If I were to ask you to name a saint, what name would come to mind? Maybe it's someone closer in time to us, Mother Teresa, or Martin Luther King Jr., or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Surely they are all in the roll call of saints, but that role is nearer and dearer to us even than they are. What is it that makes someone a saint? The Greek word that we render saint is Hagias, it just means one who is set apart for a holy purpose that's re- often rendered simply holy one, someone who's in Christ. Forty-four times the Apostle Paul used this word, hagios, for a person, hagioi, for a group of people, to refer to people who were in churches, people he already knew, people who were walking around among us, saints. Paul wanted us to see that it doesn't take an act of Congress to make you a saint, just an act of contrition. See, according to the New Testament, if you have received Christ Jesus as your own, if you are living your life for His purpose, if you've been set apart in baptism, then you are dedicated to the work of His kingdom, and you have been set apart, you have been hallowed, that is made holy, and you are a saint. And today is All Saints Day. And on All Saints Day, we remember those saints who lived and breathed and walked among us so very recently, but in the last year, they have gone to be with the Lord. The broader church has celebrated All Saints Day continuously since about the year 600. For reasons, I don't know what they are. Uh, It was originally on May the 13th. But somewhere around the year 735, somebody got the bright idea we should move it to November 1st for reasons that make a lot of sense to me, and it seems to with other folks in it for these last 1,274 years, this is when we do it. And so we remember the saints today. And we remember today that saints are not people who are perfect or there'd only be one. Saints are people who have been made right by God. You see, it's not our performance, but God's presence that transforms us into saints. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. God dwells here among us. This last month, we've spent our time looking for where God's hand is revealed in our midst. We've been focusing on here and now kinds of questions about the faith. What can I do? How will we see where God is? And that's a right concern for us. The question that's guided the last month is, what can I do to be obedient to God, to be winsome to the Spirit, to be faithful to His purpose? Maybe God is asking me to engage in some extravagant act of grace or gratitude. Perhaps God is asking me to humble myself to receive His salvation. Maybe God is asking me to deal honestly with my past so that I can move hopefully into his future. That's a right focus for us. Because if salvation is the miracle of a moment, and it is, at that moment in which you recognize the truth of the gospel, that the crucified and risen Lord died for your sin and was raised by God's love and is empowered and enthroned over all creation, when that becomes true, and you receive him as your own, and the Holy Spirit comes into you, your destiny in that moment is forever changed. Salvation is the miracle of a moment. Sanctification is the long work of a lifetime. It is the work of fitting our souls for heaven. And so it is right for us to think about and pray about and to live into our here and now faithfulness. It's been right for us to seek God's hand revealed and ask, what can I do about that? But our faith is more than 
rules for living. Our faith is more than how to be a good person. In fact, the truth is our faithfulness now flows from our gratitude from God's promised then. So we're shifting gears today. And instead of looking at what we should do, instead of looking at here and now, today we're shifting gears from here and now to there and then. We're shifting our gaze from what we can see and what we can do to the things that are unseen and eternal. And it's right for us to do that too. Because today we have shared a list of our most recent investment in heaven. Heaven becomes more real for me year by year because my treasure is there. People who I love live there. And because my treasure is there, Jesus is right, my heart more year by year is there also. And so it's right for us to ask questions about there. It's right for us to ask not only about here and now, but there and then. And this morning to do that, we're going to look at a passage from the book of Revelation. Now, I always think it's important to say a word about the book of Revelation before we actually quote it. Because it's a book that has uh, consternated the church for a long time. And people read it in all kinds of strange ways. At its simplest, this is what happens in the book. St. John, the one that the church gave the name to, is the author of the book. John was on exile in an island called Patmos, just off the coast of Asia Minor. He was there because he had committed the crime of preaching the good news of Jesus Christ in a dangerous world. The Romans were holding him away from his churches. They had boiled him alive in oil, but he did not die. John desperately wants to get a word of grace and encouragement back to the churches where he has served, beginning in the coastal city of Ephesus and following along the coastal road back into the countryside. But he needs to send this message in such a way that the churches to whom he writes will clearly understand the word that is from God and the Romans will not. And what happens to John is God gives him this expansive vision about how God is going to confront and overwhelm and overthrow all of the corruption in creation. John was given the privilege of looking and glimpsing into heaven and there he saw the promises to the overcomers, the white-robed multitudes, the victory of the Lamb, beasts and Babylon being destroyed. We remember it here in these last four windows with the seven lampstands and the seven seals and the seven trumpets. But the last vision that John received 